Akun will be reviewing the tools of UCSC Genome Browser from basic to advanced. Before I begin, I'd like to go over some reminders and housekeeping items. Some of our automatic emails may arrive to your junk email folder. We recommend that you, uh, sorry, we recommend that you, un uh, that you check that folder and add us as known senders. For individuals claiming uh, CEUs, attendance and the evaluation at the end of the webinar are required to claim your CEUs. NSTC CU uh, certificate is awarded on a quarterly basis. All non-AMZ certified genetic counselors must mail us a $25 check for NSTC to issue your certificate. For individuals seeking PACE credits, one certificate is awarded per session and it is available approximately four, week, four weeks post-session. You must keep track of your participation to verify that the CU is earned, earned are correct. Any questions regarding our CU program, you can email us at cuprogram at amgen.com. This training series is open to all professionals seeking NSGC CUs or space credits. All AMG employees, please keep comments and questions related to the presentation only. You were automatically muted when you joined the webinar. This session is being recorded. The control panel appears on the right, screen of your, right side of your screen. From the Grab tab, you can hide the control panel or view the webinar in full screen and raise your hand. From the audio pen, you can switch between telephone and computer mic and speakers. Enter your questions on the questions pen and click send. The evaluation pops up in the web browser once you are logged off after the webinar, so please uh, remember to complete the evaluation. With that, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Khan. Dr. Khan received his PhD at University of California, Santa Barbara, in biochemistry and molecular biology, where he studied the centromeres of yeast. Following a postdoctoral at UC Berkeley USDA Plant Gene Expression Study, uh, sorry, uh, USDA Plant Gene Expression Center, he taught biochemistry, molecular biology, and genetics at UC Santa Cruz. He joined the UCSC Genome Browser Project in 2003, where he is now Associate Director. The Genome Browser is a widely used visualization tool giving access to the genome of human and more than 100 other animals. Dr. Kun's responsibilities include enabling researchers through teaching the genome browser in workshops and seminars, and learning from them how to improve the browser, including identification and integration of useful new data sets. With that, I hand it over to you, Dr. Kun. Um, you may have to unmute yourself uh, to begin speaking. Okay, thank you, Vruti, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, one hour is a ridiculously short amount of time to show you all the cool features of the genome browser, so I've chosen a small number of them to uh, share with you this afternoon. I want to start with some acknowledgments. Those are the people who give us the money. Those are the people who do the work. Uh, that's where we are. We're across the bay from Monterey and across the mountain from San Jose. And we remind you that we're UC Santa Cruz, not one of those other acronyms that are uh, frequently confused for UCSC and there's a uh, picture of our team. So here are the objectives. The first three were listed on the, uh, uh, the abstract, and the fourth one, if I get a chance to uh, squeeze it in, is a tool that might be interesting to people who are doing uh, analysis of whole exome or whole genome uh, sequences. Uh, a recently released feature is the uh, support for HGVS nomenclature. Uh, which uh, in the past was a little bit difficult to find on the browser, and I'll have some examples of that. Uh, here are a few examples of the kinds of things we support, including this last one here, which is actually not official HGVS, but if there actually is an amino acid at uh, position 744 in the named gene, we can take you there. And in this format, if that amino acid is actually an alanine in one or more of the isoforms, uh, we can take you there as well. It's uh, illegitimate HGVS, but our goal is to get you where you want to go on the browser. 
Uh, here's a, a pointer to a, a training channel that we have with UCSC. Uh, we have some videos uh, at that location and some more training information here, including uh, access to a uh, form where you can request a uh, longer uh, duration uh, uh, workshop. We give workshops of up to two days typically in uh, institutions uh, uh, around the world, and you can actually find uh, links there to the uh, upcoming presentations if you uh, want to get a little bit more of the uh, browser than a single one hour. Uh, here are some links, some session links that uh, we uh, will be using today, and I'll show you how to get into the uh, session tool, and I'll come back to this link when uh, the time comes to use this information, but I wanted you to have it uh, here. If you want to jot it down, you can see it on your uh, uh, on your screen, it's in large type, and we'll uh, use that later. So now I'm going to switch over to the live demo, go directly to the genome, whoops, to the genome browser, and uh, this is the home page, UCSC, genome.ucsc.edu, and at the bottom here are some uh, news features, including a link to our new uh, uh, video that uh, was released last week, and uh, a link to the genome browser here. Uh, takes us directly to the uh, the gateway page. So in a clinical setting, the uh, organism of interest is human, but if you have colleagues or have interest in other animals, you can use our comparative genomics features and see other animals. Um, I'm going to switch this now to reset all user settings so we start at the uh, default location, which is the human HG38, the most recent uh, uh, genome. But then I'm going to switch to HG19, which is the uh, previous version of the genome, um, because it is the uh, best annotated of all of the uh, uh, all of the genomes. So the Go link then will take us into the default location on the browser, uh, with a uh, series of data sets turned on. And to simplify the picture, I'm going to simply hit the Hide All button and turn everything off, and then turn back on the uh, the gene track but I'm going to do it by navigating to a particular gene. And up here in the search box, there are a number of things you can type. And I'm going to simply type in the FGF2 uh, gene name. And then it shows up in a pull-down pop-up menu, rather. And uh, we'll choose FGF2 and hit the Go button. The result of that is that you go to that location in the genome on chromosome 4 with the genes track turned on. You can see UCSE genes here. Uh, this track is turned on, and uh, the FGF2 gene is highlighted. Uh, the view on the browser uh, shows you exons in large boxes. If you put a mouse over it, it will tell you which exon you're looking at. Over here is a narrower one, exon 2, and the introns are shown as thin lines with uh, arrowheads. And on this end, you can see a prominent untranslated region. And because this is the three prime end of the gene, that tells us that the transition between a large and a uh, small box here will be the uh, stop codon right there. Using the mouse uh, uh, drag and zoom feature, if you click anywhere in the top bar uh, up near the coordinates, you can drag, and then you have an opportunity to zoom into a location. And so here we've zoomed into a. Uh, uh, this uh, central uh, exon, and you can see on either side of the screen we have little double-headed arrows which give you the opportunity to jump immediately to the next exon off screen. It tells you that the previous exon is on the left, and over here on the right, the uh, it's hidden behind my controls, but on the right here is another arrowhead that hits uh, uh, takes you off screen to the other one. It says next and previous to give you a sense of your orientation. Uh, in terms of which uh, strand you're uh, uh, transcribing from. At this resolution, you can just barely see the alternating light and dark stripes that indicate uh, individual codons. Um, because the genome is so huge, it's often hard to know just what scale you're at, how big a particular exon is going to be. So we try to give you as many hints as possible. When you zoom in even further, you can see that we have enough room now to draw in the amino acid names. and if I zoom even farther, uh, you can have the uh, amino acid numbers. And so you can see here is a, a nice leucine at position uh, uh, 207. Um, you can also use a feature we call just drag and pan, where you can 
grab in the uh, image and drag the whoops, drag the image right and left. As long as your mouse stays within the window, it'll give you a chance to see off screen uh, some of the uh, uh, amino acids that uh, were previously uh, uh, not visible. So I'm going to turn on a number of uh, data sets that are relevant for assessing um, uh, clinical features. And in the phenotype and literature group, uh, we cluster most of the um, uh, clinical data that we have. And I'm going to turn on the uh, ClinGen CNVs, copy number variants, this uh, ClinVar variants. I'm going to turn on the decipher track, which tend to be really large variants. Uh, going to turn on the uh, LOVD variant, the Leiden Open Variant uh, Database, uh, OMIM alleles, which is individual uh, nucleotide changes uh, gleaned from the literature, uh, Uniprot variants, and finally HGMD variants. So these are all data tracks that have some relevant for uh, phenotype. Uh, there's a nice track here for gene reviews that if their uh, NCBI has a uh, an authoritative paper written by an expert, uh, there will be a, a, a box on the browser where you can identify those and click straight through to that review. I'm going to scroll down the page now to the variation group and turn on to other tracks here. I'm going to turn common SNPs on to dense and uh, oops, uh, database of genomic variants on to PAC. And these two databases uh, have information that comes from uh, individuals with no known phenotype, healthy individuals. So it gives you a look at uh, some of the data we have uh, that's just considered normal variation in the population. After you've turned any tracks on, uh, you hit the refresh button. I'm going to pause my microphone for a second and clear my nose while the screen refreshes. OK, so here we have. Uh, you can see that the benign track in Clin, uh, Gen C and Vs uh, is empty. And if those tracks uh, are, un are not interesting to you, using the right mouse button, you can simply get a little pop-up menu here and uh, uh, hide them. You can see that there's a bit of a signal here. It's a, uh, this particular total track simply adds up all the items that show up in the window below it. And in some places in the genome, it's a very high number, so you get a peak. Uh, which might be useful instead of looking at all the red and blue bars. Now our paradigm is blue for loss and, uh, uh, I'm sorry, red for loss and blue for gain. And so in this region you can see that we have some that are labeled as pathogenic by the uh, uh, ClinGen and uh, not particularly informative information on this track when you mouse over it. But if you click into it, as with any track, you get individual details about the track. So it's been identified as pathogenic. There was a phenotype in the original individual, developmental delay or other significant uh, developmental or morphological phenotypes. And you can see the size. You can see up here that it's 190 uh, megabases in size. So this is a massive uh, variant. And uh, I forget what color it was. We'll go back to the screen when we get back and uh, it will tell us if it was a, uh, it was a, uh, a duplication of a very large region. And so other data tracks, uh, sometimes the data tracks in the browser give you some information uh, uh, specifically about the phenotype. So the ClinVar track will give you uh, information about whether a, uh, a particular tra uh, item is uh, pathogenic, benign, or uh, on a certain uh, significance. It has been, uh, uh, these tracks have been uh, contributed to the database by uh, 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 lab directors at a variety of labs. And in fact, we encourage uh, everyone who has data, they can share with the world to please uh, put more data into these databases because uh, they can help for the uh, help the diagnosis in uh, other places all, all over the, uh, in other labs. Now, the decipher track tends to be really large, uh, although larger than 190 megabases is kind of hard to find. But uh, uh, you can see here that in the decipher track, we also, just by mouse over, you get some uh, um, uh, phenotype information, and they vary quite a bit because you have uh, a, ver a wide variety of start and endpoints, and uh, necessarily you'll be picking up a lot of different uh, features if you have different numbers of genes. A 
I have a little problem with this controls over here for the, uh, the webinar controls. So you can hear, see here that the labels for some of these other data tracks are present, but there's no data uh, present because we're in a very small region of the, uh, of the genome. So let's use the uh, zoom feature up here on the ideogram and drag and zoom uh, around the red bar. The little red bar indicates where we are now. And if we drag and zoom there, it gives us, uh, it says 2.2 megabases to zoom. And uh, now we can zoom out and we'll uh, populate a lot of these other data tracks with some individual items. You can see here that we still have the FGF2 gene in the middle of the screen, and we have another uh, number of other genes have shown up uh, along with multiple isoforms for those genes. So here's a nice stack of uh, ClinVar uh, variants, and you can see here that this one is identified as likely benign. And uh, for any item, you can click into it, and you can see that uh, some information from the, uh, the database itself, as well as a link back to the uh, individual uh, record in the contributing database. Uh, down here, you can see that we pick up the HGVS nomenclature, and I'm simply going to copy that, go back to the browser using the uh, back button on the browser, and then paste that HGVS nomenclature into the browser and uh, hit the Go button. So you can see here that it's highlighted in the center. There's a single base, and now we have a total of 10, uh, well, five bases on either side. Uh, padding the individual item, and uh, this is the one that we just uh, uh, clicked in, and you can see that it's also present in dbSNP, and it's a really it's a common uh, variant. It's in the dbSNP uh, common variants track, this common SNPs track here, which means it's present in the population at one percent or greater. Uh, another way to uh, uh, navigate on the browser is you can see here that we're at cytoband Q27 on chromosome four. So we can type in 4Q27 and hit the Go button. And now we're at a region of three megabases in size, and uh, we've picked up a number of other genes flanking this one. So scrolling down the page and looking at some of these other uh, data tracks, here's the HGMD uh, track. These are just the, the, uh, the data. Uh, that HGMD makes available to the public, which is typically about three years out of date. Their uh, business model is to sell you the recent uh, variants, and so we don't have access to those until they become old enough to share. You can see over here at the right side where we were zoomed in earlier, we still have this little region of uh, color from when we uh, used the HGVS uh, nomenclature. So now scrolling down the page here, you can see there are some regions that are in database of genomic variants, uh, indicating regions that are present in uh, samples of individuals uh, with uh, no known phenotype where these variants uh, are uh, deleted or duplicated. Uh, it's also possible to, uh, uh, let's look at this one here. This uh, one was of uncertain significance. This one over here is uh, annotated as pathogenic. And it is possible, although I'm not going to go into it today, to use the table browser to extract just the items that are pathogenic out of this uh, uh, ClinVar uh, track so that you could have a, a special track of your own, a custom track that you made yourself that would identify the uh, uh, pathogenic variants. But let's say you were interested in this particular gene and you wanted to highlight this region around this uh, BBS7 uh, gene. You could highlight the region and give it a colored highlight of any, any color you're interested in here, and we'll simply add that, uh, uh, that colored highlight. So one interesting feature of the browser is that once you've set up the browser, uh, you may be interested in some of these data sets and um, maybe not in others. Uh, for example, we just turned on a, a second data set of uh, genes when we used the uh, HGVS nomenclature because it pulls its locations out of the RefSeq set. If you're interested in only one set of genes, you can hide that. And it typically takes a dozen or more clicks to get just the image you're interested in. And so we have a uh, 
uh, a feature called sessions where you can create a login. I'm logged in as username example right now, and I'm going to save this session. I'm going to uh, save this session under the name Ambry2 and submit. And so that uh, means now anybody who has that information, that is to say username example and session name HG19 underscore Ambry2. And those of you who are following along on a computer can do it yourselves right now. You could do type in exactly that and hit submit and then click this browser link up here and your screen will look exactly the way my screen looks right now. So that's a very handy way to keep track of exactly what you've produced so that you can share it with colleagues. Another way to share uh, what you've produced is to export it with a, uh, a via the PDF feature and the uh, you can ex uh, export the current browser graphic in PDF and this has the uh, the advantage of being a high resolution graphic that you can import into a uh, uh, a graphic manipulation tool, save it at 300 dots per inch, and uh, uh, upload it to a journal and so forth at high resolution without it uh, uh, getting too fuzzy. Okay, so these features are ways of looking at the browser, and I uh, wanted to show you an idea of some of the data sets that we have and some of the ways to get some phenotypic information and how to uh, navigate around the, uh, uh, the genome browser. Um, let's say, for example, that you did have a, uh, a clinical sample and there was a particular range that had a uh, micro deletion or duplication and you're interested to know uh, just what genes were in that region and get an idea about maybe the uh, um, uh, the effect or the, uh, the functionality of those genes. Uh, you can do that using the table browser, uh, which brings me to the second item on the, uh, on the agenda. So using tools table browser, we'll simply accept the position that we have uh, where we were uh, zoomed in on the browser before, uh, which was uh, Cytoband 4Q27. Uh, and we want to use um, the uh, gene names to get the list of the, uh, the genes. Now, if you use the UCSC genes track and the known gene table, you'll actually export a list that has an individual line for each individual isoform of the gene. Because the UCSC genes, the known gene table, is annotated so that each uh, annotated isoform and its protein information and RNA protein and so forth uh, RNA information are kept separate. The known canonical table that's part of the UCSC genes uh, kind of matrix of, uh, uh, of data tables uh, will give us just a single item and we're going to select fields from that table so that we can get just the information we're interested in. So using selected fields from primary and related tables using the get output button then we have a chance to um, pull down the coordinates of the uh, of the gene. We want to get the gene symbol from here. This is the actual name of the gene that you're used to calling your your genes. For example, BBS7, which was in our list, and then description is a short description. Uh, the very uh, first line on our known gene details page, which I'll show you in a minute, and uh, it pulls this information from uh, NCBI RefSeq. So. Now we'll hit the Get Output button to see the results of this query. And you can see that we have a number of individual uh, genes from the uh, chromosome 4, including that BBS7 gene we were looking at, which is the bartet Beetle Syndrome 7. It's an uh, individual transcript variant. You can see here, here's another BBS gene here, uh, Bartet uh, Beetle uh, Syndrome 12. OK, using the Back button now, want to navigate directly to the genome browser. And let's click into the BBS7 gene and uh, 
get a look at some of the uh, other information that's available. Here's the short label that we just saw. This comes from the same data table, the uh, KG cross-reference table uh, that uh, we just exported to the uh, uh, via the table browser. And you can see that there's a host of other information on this uh, page, including some clinical information, uh, a lot of information about uh, pathways, and uh, links to a, a variety of other uh, variety of other tools. Um, going back to the uh, uh, genome browser page, I want to scroll down the page here and see if we have any annotations in the OMIM allelic SNP track. You can see here that the OMIM alleles uh, are individual records uh, annotated by the group at Johns Hopkins, the OMIM group, uh, a widely used database. And so if you click into these individual items, you can see here, or even at the mouse over, uh, tells you that it's a lysine at uh, amino acid 293 of whatever gene that was. Here are the genes of the BB7 uh, over here. And you can see that it's got the same uh, uh, syndrome name. And if you click into one of those items, you can go directly to uh, a page that gives you a tiny bit of information about the uh, uh, the individual variant, but then you go over to the OMIM site and uh, you get information directly from their page uh, where it's a brief paragraph uh, summarizing information that they uh, gleaned from the literature. Now another feature of the browser uh, that uh, has become quite popular uh, is the multi-region feature, which allows you to look at uh, just individual regions of the genome. And you get to it via the view multi-region uh, selection in the pull-down menus at the top. And um, clicking on that, I can show you what the options are, uh, showing just the exons, showing just the genes, or inputting a list of uh, regions that you might be interested in uh, looking at. Uh, you put Chrome in Chrome Start and Chrome End into this box, then you can navigate directly uh, uh, to it. And uh, also some uh, ability to insert uh, variant haplotypes from uh, HG19. HG38 is even more useful uh, to have that feature because there are a lot of uh, extra variants in there. At the moment, I'm just simply going to exit this because I want to use the Sessions feature to jump directly to an interesting spot in the genome with a lot of data tracks turned on. So using my data, my sessions, we'll go back to the page where we can load sessions. And here's where I want to load one of the sessions that was in this window here, the one called HG19 Exons Expression 3. And I'll simply copy that information to make it easy to, uh, to load it. And I'm going to restore those settings. And any one of you out there who's got a computer open can do the same. HG19 underscore exons expression 3. And submitting that, I go to a browser view now on the, uh, uh, on the genome that has a specific set of data tracks turned on and uh, a particular region of the genome. It's a 2 megabase region on chromosome X. And you can see that it has four sets of data, each one a different color representing four different cell lines, and the RNA-seq signal from the uh, um, one of the experiments in the uh, uh, ENCODE project. Uh, two tracks are duplicates or replicates of alignment in, on one strand, and the other two tracks are replicates that are alignments on the other strand. Uh, you can see here that this uh, doesn't use up the whole width of my screen because it was made with a, a narrower window we have a little button at the bottom, resize, which will resize the graphic at the top to fit whatever size your Firefox or Chrome window uh, happens to be. So here's where I want to use the uh, uh, exon uh, only uh, mode, because you can see here that the exons are fairly uh, narrow, and you get a little spike showing the RNA signal from these various uh, cell lines. And in a case where you're looking at RNA, or if you're looking at a, uh, uh, a whole uh, exome sequencing experiment, for example, you're not all that interested in the introns or the regions between the genes. So let's take this uh, two megabase region, go to view multi-region, 
and show just the exons, the second box here, and hit submit. So what it's going to do now, it's going to take those 16, 17, counting the genes track, these uh, 17 tracks, and slice the screen up vertically and display for us only the 27 uh, kilobases of DNA that actually represent uh, exons in the genes. And you can see here that we get a much more robust signal. You can see uh, much more clearly that, for example, this uh, cell line up here is not expressing the FGF13 gene at all. And uh, interestingly, you can see here that are two cell lines uh, representing two different tissues that are representing different isoforms or expressing different isoforms in this RNA experiment. Uh, this particular isoform here is being expressed in this uh, cell line, but not at all in this other cell line. This other cell line represented in blue is using uh, the exons over here in this part of the, uh, the genome. So if you're uh, getting your data from a whole exome uh, sequencing uh, project, uh, you can slice up the screen and show uh, only the regions that are uh, actually exons. Uh, another feature that I often forget to uh, uh, describe uh, is the, uh, uh, the keyboard shortcuts. So if I type on my keyboard uh, a question mark, uh, there we go type the question mark, there are a number of keyboard shortcuts which make it easier to move right and left on the screen. As long as you're on this browser graphics page, you can do a lot of uh, uh, different things. For example, we used resize button before. You could type just RS and it would resize. Uh, the one that I use the most and maybe about the only one I use is default view, which is a handy way of uh, exiting the uh, whole uh, uh, the uh, Exxon only mode. So if I just type DV for a default view, it'll redraw the screen the way it looked before. Oh my God, how long was I talk talking with the uh, audio off? Oh man, do I apologize for that. I have no idea how long I was doing that. Uh, it, it was just a couple of minutes, Dr. Quinn. No, no worry. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, not a couple of, It was just a, not even a minute. I think that, like, yeah, about a minute, I guess. But okay, thank you. Yeah, it wasn't yeah I got a little bit of the sniffles today, and I don't want to be snorting in people's ears. So I totally <laughs> apologize for that. Um, it's okay. Okay, so uh, I was uh, saying that I wanted to show you how to load a session, and this particular session has a custom track loaded into it. The uh, custom track here is just called PG SNP because that's the name of the uh, the variant um, uh, format for this particular data track, and it shows you your variants. Uh, in your sample, and this sample was taken from a sequencing experiment, uh, and essentially the numbers that you see there are the uh, uh, the read uh, depth of the various uh, uh, variants where you have an insertion or a deletion and so forth. So this is one of the two formats that you can load into our variant annotation integrator, which is a tool for finding out what are the uh, uh, the possible biochemical consequences of a variant. Uh, it will only recognize tracks that are in the right format, and so this particular data track is loaded. Uh, it's called Personal Genome SNPs. The, uh, there are a large number of configurable options on the page. You can, for example, look for DNA hypersensitivity or transcription factor, 
uh, overlap with your variants in case you suspect that it's a non-coding variant or some of your variants may be non-coding and uh, you're trying to figure out if it has uh, um, if any of your variants overlap with regions that might be regulatory in nature. Uh, the SIFT and polyfen scores are uh, chosen by default and uh, a number of other output formats are available but I'm simply going to leave those as the default and uh, export the information here using the variant effect predictor. So here is the uh, result and you can see that for individual variants, whoops, did I, I chose the wrong one. Okay, this is not our, the, the set that we had because I accidentally chose this sample here. Okay, so the sample that I went to first there is one that's loaded into the browser. It's a bunch of made up variants uh, that are uh, kind of show the breadth of the uh, uh, annotation types available. So let's go with get results. It's going to calculate using each one of those variants uh, what the biochemical consequences are. And uh, one thing you'll notice is that the same variant uh, shows up in multiple uh, rows in the uh, output. And that's because there are multiple um, isoforms of some genes and because this particular variant happens to be fairly close to a number of different genes. So it's uh, a downstream variant from some gene that's three kilobases away. It's an upstream variant that's near a gene 38 bases away. And another one, another isoform of that same gene that's 35 bases away and so forth. If a variant has a RS number already, if it's in the database, uh, we tell you that. So you can uh, go to dbSNP uh, perhaps and find uh, uh, more information about that that may have been uh, input there. And it will tell you information about the variant uh, if it's changing an amino acid. It's uh, in amino acid number three, nucleotide in the coding region number eight. If you include the uh, upstream uh, untranslated region, it's 48 and it's a valine to uh, alanine variant uh, with the uh, change at the center nucleotide, which uh, comports with the uh, eight because you would expect seven, eight, and nine to be the nucleotides for the third uh, codon. Over here you can see the SIFT and polyfen score, and you can just barely see at the corner here uh, that uh, the uh, explanations of the SIFT and polyfen scores are up here. And interestingly, SIFT uh, process uh, identifies this variant as damaging and the polyfin identifies it as benign, uh, which is actually useful information to know that the algorithms don't agree with each other so that you have the, uh, uh, the knowledge that you might have to dig deeper either into the algorithm or the variant or something like that. Um, uh, if they tend to agree with each other, that gives you a little bit more confidence. Uh, if they both say benign, for example, then maybe that's not the variant that's uh, responsible for your phenotype. So I'm going to navigate back to the uh, uh, the genome browser here and uh, I want to uh, point out one feature of the browser that's useful in a clinical setting and that's the uh, uh, genome browser in a box. So at the genome browser store you can download the tool called genome browser in a box which is essentially a copy of the genome browser on your own uh, desktop. And so that has the advantage that a data set such as this, the, the PG SNP data set or any of your other data that might be either proprietary or uh, constrained by confidentiality rules uh, uh, from being uploaded to UCSC to, to be imported into the browser as a, uh, uh, as a custom track it allows you to have a copy of the browser on your desktop sitting next to the data and in that way your data never has to leave the house. So you can use any of the tools of the genome browser and and uh, have access to your own data right next to the UCSC, uh, uh, UCSC data. Now the browser store is a bit of a uh, misnomer. It depends on uh, your affiliation, whether you uh, 
you pay a commercial fee for uh, the setup and the cost, or somewhere down here below, it's uh, somewhere, in, oh, free. Here. So uh, hospitals and universities and nonprofit uh, institutions are able to use the browser for uh, uh, Genome Browser for free. So you can download the uh, browser in a box. It takes a, up to about 10 gigabytes, although we recommend you have uh, 20 gigabytes on your machine so that you can download some uh, uh, data sets as well. Uh, and that way you can work completely offline. Uh, it tends to be a little bit slower when you're turning on new data tracks because it has to go to our servers to turn on the data from some of these data sets that you might not have locally rather than have the drawing code sitting right next to the data the way the, uh, uh, the web version of the uh, browser works. So a final thing to say about uh, my sessions is that this is an opportunity for uh, you to create your own account. For example, if I sign out, then my screen looks like yours would, would if you have not uh, created an account. And you can go through the process of creating an account, making your own uh, password, and then our software sends you an email to confirm that you're not a, an automated thing filling up our database with accounts. You click on the, password, on, the, uh, on the link, and then you have your own private place to store your own uh, sessions. So if I log back in, for example, as username uh, example. Oh, now I have to remember the password, right? Okay, it has all of my sessions loaded. You can see that I have 192 saved sessions going back uh, multiple years. And you can make them really private by unclicking this. And in that case, no one would be able to uh, view that session. Uh, you can also post them in our public listing. You can share sessions with everybody in the world by uh, clicking on the public listing there. And um, individuals who have an interesting picture that they would like to share on the browser, uh, they can share it that way. Uh, so a way to make it semi-private is to click the uh, share with others link but then only tell selected individuals what the actual name of your uh, session is. So they would have to know your uh, username and the name of the actual session uh, to access the session. So I'm going to go back to the browser main graphic here and uh, uh, close the, uh, the one-way portion of the, uh, the webinar and uh, open up the floor for questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Khan, for that very informative talk. I, for sure, have learned a few things about the browser that I did not know. Um, as Dr. Khan said, we do have some time for questions. Just a reminder to anyone who has questions, you can enter them on the questions pane of the GoToWebinar control panel. And I would add that the questions can be wider ranging than any of the things I mentioned if you have sp something specific that you're curious about. Okay, I think that is a question and uh, it is can you address the dense versus squish versus full features? Yes, I can. Uh, in fact, we've got a video in the pipeline right now talking about that. Um, what you see here for the UCSC Genes track is this particular track is in dense right now, uh, which is not going to change very much when we uh, switch it to full. So let's zoom out by a factor of, uh, of 10x. And you can see here we've picked up a few more genes. So this is in PAC. Did I say dense? I'm sorry, it's in PAC. And PAC is the feature that lets us put in a name next to each item. And it gives you a, uh, uh, a screen that's kind of condensed. We pack as much information onto the screen as possible. 
if we switch it now to full, you can see that each item has its own row on the screen, which for some tracks is fine, but for a track that would start to fill up the screen, you would wind up with a diagonal of items across the screen and a lot of empty triangular white space. Um, Dense gives you, uh, for the genes track, squeezes the data right together and uh, sort of overwrites the isoform information. But it, in this particular set, will show you the, uh, uh, the footprint of the genes without giving you any of the details about the, uh, the isoforms. So different uh, tracks have different uh, preferred visibilities depending on what you're trying to do. Squish does pretty much the same thing only uh, as PAC for this type of track, only as you can see, it squishes it even more, and you lose the uh, you lose the names. So if I go down to the bottom of the screen and turn on a SNPs track, let's turn common SNPs to pack. And common SNPs here are distributed as uh, tightly as we can squeeze them onto the screen. Uh, whoops! And uh, full does what you would expect. And you see, here's a case where full is not all that useful. I mean, you can see all the items and you waste a lot of screen space, but you do have the names in a uh, stack over here. Now, I like for the uh, snip tracks, depending on how zoomed I am, I like the, the dense because it throws away the labels and just shows me where the tick marks are so that the individual tick marks are uh, at the particular nucleotide. So if I uh, zoomed into this region right here, um, I would see that there's a, uh, whoops, I missed it. Let's zoom out a little bit. I thought I had a green one in the window there. Uh, okay, so here's a red one, and here's a blue one. And so I can anticipate that maybe the next question is going to be, what do the colors mean? And the short answer for that is you can find the explanation for any of the color schemes by clicking into this little button on the left side. Uh, uh, but in the context of the SNPs, the red ones will change an amino acid the blue ones are in untranslated regions, um, and the green ones are in a coding region, but they do not change an amino acid. So if I switch this to pack and zoom out by 10x, we'll probably pick up a few more. And so here are some uh, synonymous codons uh, where you have a SNP, but it doesn't change the amino acid, and here's one that does. And so for most of uh, our tracks, if you click into an item, you can learn a lot about them. For example, this one is in the... Uh, uh, it's in the common SNP, so it's going to have a minor allele frequency of 1% or more, even though it changes an amino acid. It changes an arginine to a, uh, a glycine in that isoform, but in this other isoform, it's a phenylalanine to a uh, uh, leucine, uh, which indicates it's being transcribed in a different, uh, or I'm sorry, translated in a different uh, reading frame. Thank you, Dr. Kun. Um, let's just give a couple more moments uh, if there are any more questions. Okay, looks like there are no more questions coming our way. But um, in case anyone has any further questions for Dr. Kun, after the session, you can email us your questions at um, cuprogram at aimregen.com. And thank you once again, Dr. Kun, for such an informative talk today. Also, thank you everyone who attended today. I would, like, uh, I would also like to offer everyone to join us again for our next webinar, which is on July 31st, titled Insights from the Test Utilization Subcommittee, the Economic and Clinical Impact of Genetic Test Reviews. Um, the presenter is going to be uh, Dr. Julian Hooker. And with that, thank you, everyone. Have a good day.